called upon us of passenger that Yaradua Jonathan and Buhari governments to account for 5 billion Naira Abacha loot. And Yerima urges President Tinubu to negotiate with repentant bandits. This is cross politics and I am Mary Anna Pope. The Federal High Court sitting in Abuja in a landmark judgment has ordered uh, the disclosure of the spending of details of about five billion U.S. dollars a batch of loot by the government of former President Michel Basanjo and uh, former President Umar Musa Yaradua, Goodluck Jonathan, and the Muhammad Buhari administration. Now, the court ordered the government of President Bola Tinubu to disclose the exact amount of money stolen by the General Abacha and Nigeria, um, the, the total amount of the Abacha loot recovered and all agreements signed on the same day by government of the former president of Basanjo, Yaradua Johnson and Buhari. Well, joining us to discuss this is Kolawali Uluwadari. He's the former deputy director. Well, he is actually the deputy director of Serap. Uh, thank you so much, Kalawali, for joining us. I don't know who made you former, but uh, <laughs> forgive that mistake. Thank you for joining us. Yes, let, let's start by looking at this landmark judgment. A lot of Nigerians have continuously asked questions about this judgment, um, rather the case of the Abacha loot recovery. Every single time we see several amounts of monies plastered on the faces of newspapers, and we wonder where these monies are, what they're being put to use uh, for. Although under the Buhari administration, we were told that some of those monies were going into infrastructural development. But um, for those of you who work with Serap, have you been able to follow the money or is that the reason why you went to court? Mr. Luadari, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can hear you. Um, for Serap, the inability to proper track uh, and make government account for the uh, Apache loot is what led to the, that we had sent to the government in 2020. And by government, I mean the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Finance. It was a failure to respond to the Freedom of Information request that led to the lawsuit, which, of course, the court has not granted uh, the reliefs of Serap's and has now become the judgment of court. And it's very important to understand. It is not enough for the government, and by this I mean the various administrations, to just mention the lumps of important explain to Nigerians how these funds how it, it is important that government also demonstrate to Nigerians that government has put in place transparency and accountability mechanisms to ensure that these funds don't end up the way they were in the first place, in private pockets. And we need to understand that Nigerians are victims of this theft. This fund... All right. Uh, I'm sorry, it must be the network glitch. I was speaking about the importance of having government convince Nigerians that these funds have been transparency and uh, been managed in the interest of Nigerians. And that is what we have not seen over the years from 1999 that we've been having various um, uh, return for virtual loot. Um, government is yet to demonstrate that transparency and accountability in the use and management of these funds. And so that also raises a very important question. How much, what is the exact amount of the Abacha loot that has been recovered? What has been the role of the World Bank, the IMF, or other 
international agencies in the recoveries of this loan and uh, uh, the recovery of this uh, of the loot. Uh, pardon me. Are there any terms and agreement that Nigeria has signed on to that may prevent Nigerians directly benefiting from this loot? Those are important questions that government must answer, and it is just natural. It's part of democracy and good governance. These are these are details that government should ideally uh, proactively disclose under the Freedom of Information Act, which unfortunately they didn't do, which is what led to the suit. And now we have a judgment that the government should obey. Now, Kolaole, as optimistic as I and every other Nigerian would be uh, as to, you know, the judgment and what it has said, these are governments who have left power because they no longer have immunity, so they're answerable one way or the other to the court. But if these people, when they were in power, did not feel the need to, um, under the FOI, explain to us what these monies were used for. We were always hearing window dressing kinds of responses. Who's to say that now they would respect, you know, the judgment of the court? Um, the, the, the primary parties to this suit are the, the, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Justice. Those are the two respondents in the suit that were filed in court. And the necessity for these two parties. They played key roles representing the government of Nigeria, engagements with those countries where those funds are reported for, uh, to bring the funds. And so naturally, they were the recipients of the Freedom of Information request and subsequently the respondents in the suit. So the fact that previous administrations had gone does not preclude these ministries of government, which of course are part of the continuum of government, to have record and details of these transactions. And really, this is not a tall order. It is very simple. The Ministry of Finance, of course, still exists. The Ministry of Justice still exists. And so they must have details of the roles they played, the funds that are coming, who is getting what, when and now, where are the projects situated, what are the modalities for, for situating those projects, what is the status of those projects, which company is handling those projects. And these are all details that should government should have. We have procurement laws just because a president has left office does not stop governance, it does not stop the work of governance. So now, actually, this information, Information I believe exists. It is just the willingness of government and to provide information to the public. So talking about willingness, now we have seen that, of course, now the Tunubu administration is in power. And um, even though we're yet to see um, the list of ministers and people who would head these ministry departments or agencies, but then there are permanent secretaries and directors, just as you said, in the finance department and in the, um, you know, uh, the, the department of... Um, um, justice. And I'm thinking to myself, um, how accountable will this government make sure of, you know, in terms of this judgment? Again, because you talked about the willpower of the then administrations. Now we have a new administration. There's a new sheriff in town. Who's to say, again, I ask that question sparingly, if these people will be able to um, adhere to the judgment and show up with the papers, point us in the direction that we want them to go. Just as you said earlier, we have the FOI. We always make reference to the FOI. But how easy was it for us to even access any information, even when we had the FOI at our disposal? It, it is rather unfortunate that our experience of governance over the years, particularly since the return of democracy or a brand of democracy in 1999 has led us to uh, this dysfunctional um, view of governance. We should not even be talking about what government would do with an order of court. In a same democracy, orders of court are sacrosanct. Whether, uh, no matter how they sound, they should be obeyed. And so in this instance, the executive headed by the president has no choice but to direct those ministries and agents of government who are parties in this suit to obey the orders of court. Unfortunately, ideally, we need not recourse to court to even have these ministries uh, who actually disclose this information. Oh, we've gone to court. These ministries participated in a trial. They defended the suit. Now they have law. Hmm. Pardon me. The reason why I know that 
normally, just as you've said, we should not be having this kind of conversation. We should not have be, be asking these kinds of questions. But unfortunately, just we'll as you said, we and uh, make them available. Like morality, in the practical terms of legal to allow for any reason in law, why they should not obey this judgment. And Okay, call away. I'm sorry for the dis uh, you know the, the disruption the again. Unless, of course, there is something more uh, damage there. Yeah. So, still talking about that, and let me rephrase my question again. You have said that in an, on a normal day we should not be having these kinds of conversations, querying whether governments, ministries, departments, or agencies will adhere to a court or judgment, or if you know we will even have them answer to us in any way but this is a situation of things we have seen you and i i mean we know fair up for all kinds of lawsuits uh, asking for accountability and in every different in the different aspects of our economy but we've also failed to see government answer to those you know court cases or even show up or even do anything in that regard hence my question again and again because if we, if you go to court and you obtain a judgment, you ex expect that these ministries would adhere immediately, fall, um, you know, into place and begin to do the net, the needful. But because we find ourselves in a country such as this and a democracy that is somewhat skewed and a judiciary that we really can't trust, unfortunately, I, I, I hate to say this, but. Um, many people used to regard the, the judiciary as the last hope of the common man, but m many might not necessarily be able to, you know, trust the judiciary. But thank goodness the process has said this is what it is. But can we trust the people we call our leaders to deliver on the same dividends of democracy that we say that we are operating under? That's why I asked that question in the first place. It's still plus politics, and we're still being joined by Kalawale Uluwadare. He is the deputy director of Serap. Uh, Kalawale, before we lost that connection with you, um, you and I were, you know, jaw drawing about the fact that it's because of the situation we find ourselves in and the democratic, the so-called democracy that we have in Nigeria and how it's been operated by different governments. Uh, this is why we're querying if, you know, this judgment holds any weight. And if we would see heads roll at the end of the day, what does Sarah hope to get out of this? Aside from the fact that the court's judgment is out and the court hopes that these ministries, these two ministries, um, would one way or the other be able to tender some form of evidence to prove that these monies were used if they were used in any way. And if there have been any progress in the infrastructural development that these monies have been channeled to. But aside from that, what does Sarah hope to see at the end of the day? Do we hope to see heads roll? Do we hope to see people who have one way or the other diverted government funds go to jail or face trial? What is, what's, what's in it for Sarah at the end of the day? The aim of the lawsuit and the request that led to it um, is transparency and accountability. Was and still is transparency and accountability, and it was done in public interest. The aim is to ensure that Nigerians take up this advocacy as part of the advocacy for good governance and democracy and make these demands consistently. It means that issues of transparency and accountability like this remains on the front burner of public discourse and people begin to talk about it. And that ensures that government responds to the people since democracy is always about the people. And that also means there will be a larger impact that if any of those funds were to come in under the Tinubu administration, Naturally, those questions will also be asked of this administration and ensure that government does the right thing. Sarah has filed a lawsuit of the public interest. The judges have given judgment. Now it is left for the people who believe in democracy to make government do the right thing. Well, let's, yes, hoping that government will do the right thing. And then there's a lot to, that's, that's ahead of the Tinubu administration, and many eyes are on them to uh, see if corruption will be dealt with as they have promised. Kola Waleo Luadare is the Deputy Director of Serap, and we want to thank you for joining us on the show tonight. Thank you very much. When we return, we'll be talking about putting an end to banditry and, of course, terrorism in Nigeria. Um, former Governor Yerima uh, has some ideas on how the Tunisian administration can deal with it. We'll be right back after this break.